Good morning. On behalf of the First Presbyterian Church of Fairfield, I welcome those of you in our sanctuary and those who are watching online. Whether you're a member or just here for the first time, we warmly welcome you to our service and to our spirit and congregation. We invite you now to enter into a time of worship. Hear this call to worship. There is none like you, O Lord. All the nations that you have made shall come and bow down before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. You alone we are called to worship. Please stand if you are able. Hymn number 307 is found in the blue hymnal. Please be seated. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Please join me in saying the prayer of confession. Lord, only you are significant enough to deserve glory. 
So why do we desire glory for ourselves? Lord, to know you is to have eternal life. So why are we satisfied with worldly wisdom and living in the moment? Through Jesus, we receive the love of the Father. So why do we hunger for the love of the world? Our desires are no longer trustworthy guides to goodness, and what seems natural to us no longer corresponds to your design. Lord, forgive us for our failures, overhaul the desire of our hearts, and grant us greater trust in Jesus, our Savior. Let us take a moment to silently confess our sins. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his mercy, we have given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. In the name of Jesus the Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Please stand for the Gloria Patri. Please be seated.
It's a great anthem to remember and to be in this season of Lent. Today, as we journey through Lent with Christ through the eyes of John, we encounter a turning point in John's gospel. We move through the first 11 chapters over the past six weeks or so, and we looked at the miraculous signs that Jesus performed to show us who he is and what he came to do. And when we move this morning to John chapter 12, we move from the book of signs to the last week of Jesus' life before his death and resurrection. And in John's gospel, Jesus' last week begins with a thank you supper. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning in John chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. And just, as a, just so you understand the context and the backdrop, immediately before this story, this supper, six days before the Passover, Jesus is in hiding. Jesus is hiding out in the wilderness because the hate has intensified. The opposition to him and his ministry has intensified and they are looking to arrest and ultimately kill him. And so now Jesus comes out of hiding and we begin to look at his last week here on earth in John chapter 12 verses 1 through 11. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the, one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you. You can always serve the poor, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. As a boy, we celebrated Thanksgiving at my Aunt Debbie's and Uncle Tony's house. And last Thanksgiving was the first time my wife and I brought our children to the place where I celebrated Thanksgiving as a child. And when we opened the front door, for me, it was the sight of Thanksgiving. It was the sound of Thanksgiving. And with the smell of turkey came the smell, the aroma of Thanksgiving. And I have to admit, through the sight, the sound, and the smell of Thanksgiving, I was overwhelmed, but overwhelmed in a good way. I was filled with joy, filled with gratitude, filled with comfort. It brought me back to Thanksgivings with Grandma and Grandpa. Thanksgivings with backyard football. Thanksgivings expressing our gratitude around the table for God's blessings. And this might sound strange, but last Thanksgiving was the sight, the sound, and the smell, not simply of Thanksgiving, but the sight and the sound and the smell of love. When you look back at your life, what is the sight? What is the sound? What is the smell of love? 
I believe that John, Matthew, and Mark can't help but record this Thanksgiving dinner because as they looked back on this dinner to give thanks to Jesus for raising Lazarus from the dead, they found, they remembered the sight, the sound, and the smell of love. It was literally a dinner to give thanks to Jesus, for he raised their brother Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha, along with grateful friends and family of Lazarus, gather around the table to give Jesus thanks. And in Jesus' day, when you attended a big holiday dinner, a wedding, or a party, it was normal to be greeted by being treated for your body odor. Yes, I, I said it. It, is, it was normal to be greeted when you entered a party by being treated for your body odor. The assumption about you and your family when you entered the party was that you stink. The, the assumption about your neighbor and their family is that they stink. The assumption about all people in Jesus' day is that everybody stinks. Think about it. It was a time before deodorant. A time before brushing your teeth. A time before running water. And Bethany was in the nation of Israel, the Middle East. It was a hot climate. To counter the stench of body odor and bad breath, it was ordinary for someone to smear, rub, or dab the guests with scented oil, and the idea was to envelope you in a pleasant smell. It was the ancient equivalent to you and I putting on perfume or cologne. And this common act of rubbing, smearing, and dabbing scented oil was called anointing. When I was a boy, my, my mother, who is Italian-American and uh, famously frugal, used to encourage me to use olive oil to keep my scalp and my hair healthy. It was cheaper than hair gel. And, and I would, this is when I had more hair, hallelujah. I, I would rub the oil into my hair, and what was I doing? I was anointing myself with oil. During this Thanksgiving dinner for Jesus, the men are eating in a reclining position. Back then, they didn't sit in chairs when they ate. They reclined. Doesn't that sound nice? When they reclined at the table, it was ordinary that their feet would be facing out. And in comes Lazarus' sister, Mary, carrying a jar of perfumed oil. And what the people around this Thanksgiving table are expecting is for Mary to do what people ordinarily did for their guests at dinners rub, smear, or put on a little bit of oil, guest by guest. John says in verse 3, Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. Pure nard was found in northern India. It was a imported perfume, a very expensive perfume, but it was not just the perfume that was expensive. In Matthew chapter 26, we learn that the oil Mary carried was stored in an alabaster jar. Jesus' disciple Judas Iscariot declares, it's worth a year's wages. It is very, very expensive oil. We learn through John that Martha is serving. That means that the family of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus was not a wealthy family because they did not have servants of their own. They were the ones serving. The jar and the oil, as many commentators believe, was the most expensive thing that Mary and her family owned. It is the financial security blanket of the entire family, right? The, the 401k, the retirement savings plan, the pension plan. If there was a war or a famine or a pandemic, the family wouldn't starve as long as they saved this jar of perfumed oil. 
the expectation around the table is for Mary to place a dab in their hair or on their foreheads. Mark chapter 14, verse 3 tells us, she broke the jar. She, she didn't, when you go home, if you have perfume or cologne, you, you'd never break the jar, right? It, it would be way, way too much of a fragrant offering. You wouldn't break the jar. What Mary did was, was completely unthinkable. In a moment, she, in a flash, she used up her entire life savings. She, when you break a jar or a bottle, the contents spill out. It goes everywhere. It's a 12-ounce bottle. Mark says that she broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. There's so much oil that it must be running down Jesus' head and hair. It's on his face, his neck, his beard. The oil is absorbed by his skin and clothes. We would say that Jesus was fully anointed, yet Mary wasn't finished. John gives us this detail. Mary must have let down her hair. And that day for a single woman, letting down her hair was a scandalous act. Mary lets down her hair. The Bible refers to the woman's hair as her crown of glory. It was considered the, the, the cleanest, most cherished, most adored, most beautiful part of a woman's body. She uses her crown as a rag to wipe Jesus' feet. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. How was Mary's act? This unthinkable, unexpected act received by those around the Thanksgiving table. Did they give Mary thanks for being so kind to Jesus? Well, John highlights Judas Iscariot's reaction, the one who betrays Jesus. And of course we say, well, that was Judas, right? Judas saying uh, kind of deceitfully this money ought to have been used to serve the poor. What a waste. However, when you read the, the version of, of Mark in Mark chapter 14, he does not limit this objection, this protest, simply to Judas Iscariot. Here's what Mark says. He says, some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste? Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a, a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And then... They rebuked her harshly. Rebuked means to charge at someone with disapproval. Last week in John chapter 11, uh, perhaps you remember from the sermon, Jesus used this same term when Jesus was going to the tomb to raise Lazarus from the dead. It was translated as deeply moved. Do you remember what this means to, to rebuke harshly, to be deeply moved? It means to bellow with anger, snort, roar like an animal. Those in the room started yelling at Mary. They went on the attack. It's wasteful. Get up, woman. You disgust me. You're disgusting. You're wasteful. You're disgraceful. You're disappointing. What a waste. And here is Jesus' response to their response to Mary. Leave her alone. He defends her. He protects her. He stands up for her. He silences her critics. He says this, it was intended. Oh, by the way, she's following God. I know you don't understand it. I know that you want to judge and condemn Mary, but indeed, she is following God's will by pouring out, breaking her jar and pouring out her oil to anoint me. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you. You can always serve the poor, always serve the poor, but you will not always have me. Perhaps sometimes to be faithful to God means upsetting church people. Perhaps serving Jesus 
means, perhaps faithfulness to Jesus, doing what God intends you to do, means confusing all people. Uh, per perhaps uh, the actions that God are leading you to take will not be received kindly by people, but are the actions that God intends you to take. Jesus is touched uh, deeply by Mary's act, the sacrifice of the broken jar, the laying down of her crown of beauty for Jesus' glory. Why? Mary, Mary, not, not Lazarus, Mary, not the 12 disciples. Mary is the sight, the sound, and the smell of love for Jesus. Mary gets it. Mary understands what the disciples do not yet understand, what you and I may not yet understand. Jesus is worth it. He's worth her life savings. He's worth her reputation. He's worth her attention. He's worth rejection. He's worth exchanging her glory for his glory. Mary embodies love for Jesus and, and she embodies love for all who would dare to follow Jesus. She's willing to give to Jesus what is of greatest worth because she makes Jesus her greatest worth. She, she's willing to give that which she holds of greatest value and worth because for her, she cherishes Jesus as her greatest worth. Do, do you know what that's called? When, when you ascribe to someone ultimate worth? Do, do you know what it's called to be the sight, the sound, and the smell of love for Jesus? We have a word to describe it. The word is worship. We, we, we shortened the word. We call it worship, but it comes from the English word worth-ship. Worth-ship. The sight, the smell, the love of God is worship. And, and I know that we often associate worship with what we're doing right now singing and praying and preaching. And these things are worship, but worship is so much more. Worship is when you bring to God something of great worth to bless God because you ascribe ultimate worth to God. Worship is when you bring to God something of great worth to bless God because you ascribe ultimate worth to God. Mary gives something of great worth to bless Jesus because she ascribes to Jesus ultimate worth. She breaks the jar. She pours out the jar. She, she makes the sacrifice. She goes low to love and to serve Jesus. You have a jar. Stop lying to yourself. Stop telling yourself that you don't have a jar. You, you have a jar. You have many things that are of worth. In fact, you are of worth. Maybe it's better to think of yourself of the jar that holds the perfumed oil, the things of great worth. Every day you have a jar. Every day you have a decision to be the jar. You carry many things of great worth. Your time is of great worth. Your evenings are of great worth. Your weekends are of great worth. Your gifts are of great worth. Your education is of great worth. Your personality, the unique blend of you, is of great worth. And your great worth is not based on your appearance. Your great worth is not based upon your money. Your great worth is not dependent upon your success. Your great worth is not dependent upon what other people think about you or have told you is of great worth. You have been created in the image of God. That means that you are of great worth. And where Mary is challenging us is to see that we are of great worth, that we have things of great worth to offer to God and to be willing to take moments, strategic and calculated risks in order to to, to make Jesus Christ our greatest worth by pouring out to him that which is of great worth. You believe it? What you have to offer to Jesus Christ, what you have to offer to further his kingdom is of great worth to God and of great worth to his church and of great worth to this world. Hallelujah. 
You have a jar. You are the jar. It means being willing to break the jar. It means being willing to make a sacrifice in order to serve God. That's what worship is. We just offer our service, offer our gifts, our time, our talents to God. How can you break the jar and pour out your oil onto Jesus? Hey, Mary knew she was taking a risk. You don't think she was filled with fear? Her life savings were in the jar. You don't think that she had a second thought? Come on. But she was willing to take the risk. She was willing to make the sacrifice. I see how you all are breaking the jar and pouring out your oil onto Jesus. I, I, I see how you sacrifice your evenings and weekends. I, I, I see how you're breaking your jar and pouring out your oil by loving difficult people. I, I see how you're breaking your jar and pouring out your oil by volunteering to lead Bible studies. I, I see how you're breaking your jar and pouring out your oil by showing up for events that maybe you wouldn't choose but lending a helping hand. You're, you're, pouring, you're breaking the jar and you're pouring out your oil for Jesus. And I know it makes you tired. I know it makes your body ache. I know you, you might wonder from time to time, am I really making any difference at all and I'll say this to you when you can't see the difference you're making a difference to Jesus when, when you're tempted to believe that it's wasteful it's not wasteful for Jesus Mary moves his heart when she breaks her jar and pours out her oil we have the opportunity every day to break the jar pour out the oil and move Christ's heart so what does that look like for you? Is it picking up the phone? Is it volunteering to set up a coffee hour? Mary, when she worships, becomes the sight, the sound, and the smell of love to Jesus and to us. And she knows that Jesus is worth it. I want to conclude by sharing two thoughts with you. The first is this. When Mary gets down on the ground and she wipes Jesus' feet with her hair, when she anoints Jesus, the, John says that the entire house is filled with the fragrance of the perfume. The, the, the entire house senses, smells uh, her worship to Jesus. Now, the jar is empty at this point. It has been poured out upon Jesus. And so the smell of worship is on two people, Jesus and Mary. Mary uh, has the oil, the anointing upon her because she wipes Jesus' feet with her hair. When Mary worships Jesus, who's anointed? Jesus and Mary. Now, I, I, I set up the sermon by telling you that anointing was a common practice. It was a common occurrence when you attended a party. But when you read scripture, when there was a moment to appoint a king, to appoint a prophet, or to appoint a priest, they were anointed to fulfill their purpose. And when they were anointed as king or priest or prophet, they were filled with the presence and power of God to accomplish their purpose. The Bible tells us in, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, when Samuel, the prophet Samuel, anoints the shepherd boy David to be king over Israel, Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. What I sense is there is a relationship between the power and the presence of God and worship. Worship. Some of us are wondering where God is. We're wondering, maybe even feeling like we're missing out. I'm not experiencing the power and presence of God in my life. And my advice to you would be worship. When you're willing to serve God, God gives you the power and the presence in order to accomplish the task. You, you want the power and presence of God for what? In order to worship him. And when you worship him, you find the power and presence of God. Like Mary, you find yourself anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So, so I would say to you, worship him. Worship him. Here's the other thing. And, and I read a lot of, I read a lot of biblical commentaries. None of them say this. So, so feel free to reject this. But this is what I feel like the Lord put on my heart. Jesus is fully divine. He is God. John makes it very clear he is also fully human. He gets hungry. He gets tired. He gets weak. He, he asks questions. He has doubts. Jesus is about to kick off a week in which his identity will be called into question. It's worse. He, he, he's not just, his identity is not just called into question. He is mocked and put to shame for being, for claiming to be who? The Christ. It's not his last name. I know you grew up thinking, Jesus, Christ is the last name. No, 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 no. Christ was in office. The meaning of the word is anointed one. When Mary gets down on her knees and wipes his feet with her, with her hair and anoints him, she is confirming to Jesus what is true about Jesus, his identity. He is the Christ. Jesus, Mary is showing everyone around the table and those of us who look back on the event that Jesus is who he says he is. He is Jesus the Christ, the anointed one. Further, Jesus is going to leave that supper. He will be under terrible scrutiny and persecution. I wonder if it helped him through some of his most difficult days, his darkest times, to smell the anointing. She anointed him, and in anointing him, she encouraged and empowered him for the task of taking upon the cross and the sins of the world, facing eternal, sep facing separation from God for the first time in all of eternity. Indeed, Mary was serving Jesus Christ in a powerful way. I believe that's why Jesus says in Matthew and Mark that wherever the gospel is preached, Mary, this act will be memorialized. She becomes the sight, the sound, and the smell of love for Jesus and for us. You have a jar. You can move Christ's heart. You can serve the Lord in a powerful way through a simple act. So how is God calling you to break the jar, to pour out your love on others, so that Jesus Christ, the anointed one, will be worshipped, for he is worth it. Thanks be to God. Amen. If you are able, would you please stand and join me in our affirmation of faith, the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son tether is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Will you pray with me? Lord, we come before you, having confessed our sins, having worshipped your name. Now we come, Lord, hungry, thirsty, maybe even broken in some ways. And we ask that just as Mary was anointed as she anointed you, your power and your presence would come upon these elements and come upon us, that we are in desperate need of you, of a filling, of fresh wind, of, of new strength and life. So will you come and anoint us? As we seek communion with you, come, Lord Jesus, come. In your name we pray. Amen. On the night of Christ's arrest, he took bread, he blessed it, gave thanks to God, and after blessing it, broke it, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. In the same way, after the supper, Christ took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant, sealed with my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sin. Take and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. And friends, every time you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God. If you haven't yet taken out your bread, you may do so now. For those who are watching at home, you are welcome to join us at home as we seek communion with the Lord. The bread of life given for you. blood of Christ shed for you.
Would you join me in our prayer of thanksgiving? O Christ, you have opened to us the scriptures and have been known to us in the breaking of bread. Stay with us, we pray, that we may go in the strength of your presence and your truth all our journey through, and at its end behold you in the glory of the eternal Trinity, the only God forever and ever. Amen. Would you please join me in prayer? Gracious and loving God, we thank you so much, Lord, that you see us and you know us, that you delight in us, that you call us to yourselves. Father, we want to be people who come with all that we have, that give our very best to worship you and serve you, Lord. But we need you because there's so much in this world that pulls us and distracts us, Lord, we need you. So we ask, Father, that you would strengthen us to keep our eyes focused on you, to be rooted in your word and to stand firmly on the power of your love so that you may pour into us, so that we may go into this world and pour out of our jar to others, that we may show the love of Christ in us and through us that we may be a light in the hurting world that would point others to you, that would bring you glory, and that our lives would be worship for you, Lord. You've called us to love one another and serve one another. So, Father, in our worship, we come with, to you with hearts that are heavy as we lift up our brothers and sisters around us, Lord. We lift up Dave Hill's family, Father. We thank you for his life, Lord. We thank you for your presence and your comfort for his family. We thank you that you continue to draw them close to each other and are strengthened by you, Lord. We lift up Jean Harbinson's family. We thank you for her, Lord. And we ask that your hand be upon her family, those who are grieving and mourning, that you would be their comfort and peace during this time. We lift up our brother Don Brown. Father, we ask for your hand of peace upon him. We ask for strength. We ask for you to pour your love and your presence out on him, Lord. And we lift up Elaine to you and we ask for strength. We ask for perseverance, Lord. And we thank you that their eyes are fixed upon you in this time. Father, we thank you that when we call upon your name, you turn your ear and are faithful to hear us. All of the prayers that we lay at your feet, but even those that we hold close to our hearts. Father, thank you for being faithful to answer us. And in our waiting for your answer according to your will, strengthen us and give, you, and give us your peace. And as we continue to worship you, Lord, we all come together as your people and we say the Lord's Prayer as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we have much to rejoice about with some announcements that I'm going to bring with you today. Maybe some of you have heard of the Alpha course that we've run here several years ago at the church, and we're very excited that we are going to run that again right after Easter. And if you haven't heard of Alpha, well, it's a series of conversations that we come together to explore those big questions that we all want to ask, but here we can do it together without fear of judgment or the pressure of having to know all the answers. Alpha is wonderful because it doesn't matter where you are on your faith journey, whether you've been a believer for a long time, if you're new to the faith, or if you're not even quite sure about the faith. 
So you have RSVP cards in your pews if you're interested in more information. This is gonna be starting Tuesday mornings at 10.30 in person on April 18th, and it'll be also on Zoom starting April 20th on Thursdays at seven o'clock. Also check out and keep your eyes open in our newsletter because there'll be more info coming each week on that. I'm very excited to be up here to praise the Lord and what he's done as he has brought us in our new traditional worship director. So I would love for us all to give a warm welcome to Irina Georgievia. <laughs> We're very excited to have you. We, we just are so thankful that God has brought you to us. And we have another thing to rejoice about. We have someone here that is ready to reactivate their membership here with us. And so I would like to call Tamara Castro on up. Hey, Tamara, we're so happy you're here. Are you nervous? A little bit. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna ask you a few questions to react to your membership. There's nothing to be nervous about. We are celebrating this, we're rejoicing this. This is a happy moment, it's right. a good moment. It's a good moment for you, for your family, and for your church family. Okay. So I'm gonna ask you, who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Great. Do you trust in him, do you? I do. Do you intend to be his disciple, to obey his word, and to show his love? Great. Will you be a faithful member of this congregation, giving of yourself, and will you seek the fellowship of the church wherever you may be? Will you? I will. Do you, the congregation, promise to encourage, support, pray for, and empower Tamara as she seeks to follow and serve Jesus Christ as a part of this church family? Do you? If you do, please clap your hands. So we're going to start by fulfilling our vow by praying for you. Okay. So let us pray. Lord, we thank you for Tamara's life, your purpose, the way that you have given your life so that she may live an abundant life. We, we thank you, Lord, for where she's been and where you're bringing her. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue to use her to be a blessing to you and to be a blessing to your people that through her life, Jesus Christ would be known and loved. And as she grows deeper in Christ, we ask that you would show her the new and, and different things that you're bringing into her life as she journeys with you. In Christ's name, amen. Praise God, you're in. to be thankful about and the Lord has blessed us immensely and it's out of that blessing that we come and we give an offering to the Lord of what he's already given us and some of these things that we um, support in our offerings is ministries of the church and going outside of the church and furthering the kingdom and so I just want to highlight one thing that we recently did with our offerings is we took a group of middle schoolers on a youth retreat last year that they have never been. They were all sixth graders and never have been. And those are the kinds of things that we can do when we come with gratefulness and we give to the Lord and he takes that and multiplies. So if you've come today with an offer, offering, there are offering plates to joyfully give in the back. If you're watching at home, you can um, give an offering online or mail your check-in. And we just wanna thank you for partnering with what the Lord is doing. So at this time, I'd like to invite you, if you're able, to stand for our doxology and our final hymn, hymn number 76.
I want to invite you to greet Tamara at our coffee hour immediately following our service and give her a warm First Presby welcome. And as we go from this place, may we be poured out as Christ was poured out for us with love. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon each of us on this day and forevermore. And we all say together, amen.